welcome Nicolas Labarre from the University of Bordeaux, Montaigne, teaches American society and culture. Welcome, Nicolas. Thanks. Thanks for having me. We are going to talk about comics and your journey and everything in between. Um, so let's first out of the gate, I want to know how it is that you ended up in comic studies. I would say by chance, really, because that, that's not something I had in mind. But um, during my master's degree, I was so I did my um, I did my dissertation in the first year of my master's degree on James Ballard, the science fiction writer, and I was looking for something that would um, that would go against the grain of academia. So comics sounded like a good subject. And at the same time, my, my sister, who's an illustrator, was looking for someone to write scripts for her. So she asked me if I could uh, write her some short scripts so she could try out comics. And the, um, the two things happened at once. I was looking for a subject. She was looking for someone to write comics. And I had been interested in comics for a long time. But I started reading about comics and realizing there was a feel. There were uh, writers. There were, I mean, it was not fully fully developed. That would have been in the the very early 2000s. So, um, little internet internet resources. Um, the availability of comics was not back issues were not that great in France. But that got me into into comics. And when I I did my PhD on something different on uh, theories of mass culture in the U.S., but I managed to sneak in a chapter about Mad Magazine. So I was doing that and after my PhD I basically shifted to, to comics because I realized that that's that's what I was interested in plus um, there was it was quite clear at the time that at least in the US um, there was a substantial interest in comic studies it was taking shape uh, it was there were more monographs being published and so all of that combined convinced me that it was possible to do the same thing in France even though at the time um, talking about comics in conferences was really something that I mean, you had to justify what you did every single time. So there was a lot of grand word. There was a lot of explaining to do. And over maybe the first three, four years, she, things changed dramatically. I could see that I, I was, I moved from being the one comic specialist in the room to being, to talking to an audience that was at least interested in comics, that considered comics to be a worthwhile subject. So that was a really the transition um, started to do comics and write about comics at the same time and realizing there was an opportunity there. That's really interesting, especially I, I didn't I didn't realize there was a slight disconnect there because of course France is known for having a long and deep history of comics just being a part of kind of you know everybody's life and not a sort of, you know, niche. And in fact, Asterix and all that being kind of sold in bookstores, right? Um, and yet, as you mentioned, comic studies itself, um, you know, took a little bit of getting going. Yeah, or more, more accurately, perhaps, comic studies happened in France, but not within academia. So there were monographs being published, there were great scholars doing great work, but they were not part of universities. So there was really no place for, especially no place to be tutored uh, in comics. There were no comics courses. There were, they, the, the structure wasn't there to generate new scholars within academia. Um, and again, I, I take no credit for that, but uh, the, I was one of the first of a second generation, the people who managed to, uh, to who arrived in French universities at the time in which uh, comic studies became somewhat institutionalized, in which the idea was not uh, so controversial. Yeah, no, really fascinating history. Um, so here, tell us about uh, your interest in genre. And um, you mentioned a little earlier, kind of you know, sneaking that mad magazine chapter in, but um, I know that there's a deep interest in genre for you and magazine culture, et cetera. Um, and this book, Understanding Genres in Comics, published with Palgrave, which by the way is on huge sale right now for the ebook, 
is, uh, is, is fresh, kind of hot off the press. So tell us about this book and why you're interested in genre. Yeah. So that's a project, project which actually started maybe 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, I was going to do a talk at a conference about um, the Aliens comics, um, the film adaptation, but also a crossover between Superman and Aliens. And I tried to do that, and it was in, a con in the, the context I mentioned earlier, in which you had to explain, you had to contextualize everything. And the talk didn't go well at all. So it was a disappointment. And also I realized slightly later on that not only was I talking to the wrong people or people who were unprepared to hear what I had to say, but that, that I was unprepared. I didn't have the theoretical tools to grapple with adaptation and genre and uh, horror in particular in comics. So I shelved that and came back to the, my, my, original, my original talk over the years and thought, there's a way to improve that. There's a way to, there's a way to come back to, to what I had done and to make it right this time. And in particular, I was influenced by Rick Altman's writing on film genre. Uh, so Rick Altman wrote, wrote a book called Film Genre in 1999, which is a perfect book. That's a perfect academic book. That's the book you want to read about jaw, jaw uh, in films. So I read that, and I revisited that talk. And uh, two years ago, I um, revised uh, a section of that original talk from ten years ago for a conference in Leeds, and talking about the crossover between Superman and Alien in 1995. So, an admittedly mediocre comic book. I'm very interested in average and mediocre comic books. Uh, that's what, what uh, really fascinates me. So it was re-average. It's not bad, but re-average. And I gave a talk in which I emphasized all the, 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 the plays on genre that happened in crossovers and also questioning the function of crossovers, of these intercompany crossovers in the general ecology of genres in comics. I gave that talk, it was well received, and Roger Sabin, who, um, who is the, the, uh, the editor for the, 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 the Paul Grave collection, um, suggested that this could become a short book or at least it could be the seed for a short book. And I realized that uh, all the work I'd been doing on JOR um, had not reappeared in a coherent form and that writing a book would give me the opportunity to reread everything I'd written, to just try to re-come to terms with what JOR's meant or more acutely what Jaws did in comics. And the Alien Superman chapter became one chapter in the, in the book. And the rest was uh, trying to re, trying to take what had been done in film studies in particular, and trying to, but acknowledging the fact that film studies, when they, when Jaws is studied if in film studies, uh, it is studied with a specific, with an interest in the history of the medium, with the, the economic system, with the studio system in particular, so that you could not simply take what had been written about film and transpose it to comics, that you had to redo all the work, that you could take the theoretical insight, but that you really had to um, think about what it meant to, um, to transpose what had been done by Hollywood studios to um, comics publishers. And because these are very different economic structures, because they, they have a different status, because they have a different uh, reach also, uh, everything had to be redone, rethought. So that, that's pretty much the book. Let me ask you, Nicolas, while I've got you here, have you studied cases, and I'm sure you have, where we move within a comic story to another comic story, but where we go from, say, um, a romance to a detective uh, uh, sort of um, you know, story shape? And does the story, is the story given a new shape, actually? Well, I would say it depends, but um, one of the cases which I discuss in the book, which I find fascinating, is an issue of Dazzler. I think that's Dazzler number 13, again, a very average comic book. And Dazzler is structured, uh, that specific issue is structured in two halves. The first is basically a romance comics. Uh, you get close up on 
teary faces. Uh, she's uh, the heroine is dressed elaborately, so there's an, a, a lot of emphasis on relationship, fashion, and also a lot of thought bubbles. So all of the everything that uh, comes to that has come to signify romance comics. And at one point, she is trapped in a prison for complex superheroic reasons and um, she as, after the turn of a page the story changes entirely the layout is different the way she's dressed is different and she's dressed in a prison in a regular prison uniform at the end of the first section you turn the page and suddenly it's much shorter and it's much more revealing and it turns into this sort of wrestling match with other with other super with super villains and the um, you can see the moment in which clearly you shift from one genre to another even though the whole book is marketed as a superhero comic but i would say other comics might uh, certainly offer different configurations but this is one clear demonstration that um, the simple exercise of assigning a genre to a comic to a, com a comic book even to one single comic book in a ser in serial publication that it doesn't work exactly that way that you have a, a constant back and forth between the significant the signifiers employed in the book and the marketing choices dazzler is a superhero comic book there's no question about that but within the comic book you see that elements are borrowed and repurposed from established genres to create this tapestry and sometimes you you see the hinges and this is one interesting example because the hinge is so clear and it affects everything in the comic book mm. the writing the dialogue the again down to the way she's dressed I love it. It's so fascinating to me that there are these um, other really subtle ways that creators, teams of creators, uh, revitalize and create energy, even just on the level that you were talking about here. Um, so, Nicolas, here we have Hawkeye, um, you know, t like early, t you know, like 2013 ish. Um, how would yeah, walk us through your approach and how we would read something like this. So Hawkeye is a fascinating series. Uh, it's very experimental while being mainstream. So it's a superhero story, but uh, it has all this formal playfulness throughout the series. And issue number eight is the romance comics theme issue. Uh, it is framed as a romance comics it includes full pages uh full pages which replicate um uh, which mock romance comics covers uh with period accurate price tags so all the details are right so i think it does two things um one is it shows the awareness of the history of the medium hawkeye is a series which is playful about its own existence it's a series about a, a minor superhero doing everything that's all the non-superhero stuff that is so present in 1960s and 1970s Marvel, uh, superheroes going on about their lives. And Marvel is, sorry, Hawkeye is really about that. It's really about taking the, the, the daily stuff and um, expanding it and seeing it from the point of view of the dog. And uh, again, this playfulness about the irrelevancy of the, the lack of relevance of superheroes uh, by just taking the superpowered guy and putting him in a in a derelict uh, in a derelict building, which is trying to shield from this uh, mob these mob guys. So there's one element which is displaying a sense of connection with the readers, but a certain type of readership, demonstrating uh, shared knowledge, shared culture. So that's, I think, an important part, saying, see, we care about not comics, but we care about the history of comics and the minutiae about the history of comics, all those uh, slightly forgotten genres, things that are obsolete. So there's a form of nostalgia, obviously, in, uh, involved here. But I would say that what's fascinating is that this borrows some of the um, signifiers, again, of romance comics, but it doesn't really borrow the mechanisms of romance comics. It includes these nuggets, uh, the hearts that you see on the pages we have on display, but also the, the mark covers and also some situations. But for instance, on the mark covers, you have thought, thought balloons, uh, which are very typical 
of the of romance comics, but they do not appear in the Hawkeye story itself. So they are neatly segregated from the story. From the story, they belong to a slightly different universe. They are meant they are meant in, not to function as romance, but to uh, conjure the cultural memory of romance comics. Uh, to say, see, there's another way to read comics. Uh, there, there are other readers implied. So in a way to try, and the, Hawkeye is very nostalgic. There's a very 1970s feeling about that. But to by including romance comics, I think the Fraction and Aja uh, really try, are really trying to um, again, tap into this cultural memory, not so much to write their own romance comics. This is not a pastiche. This is a playful evocation of the fact that mainstream comics, Marvel comics, used to include other approaches, other types of, um, of stories, and that they were deeply connected to romance comics. I mean, uh, the, the amazing Spider-Man stories from the, from the late 1960s bear very strong similarities to the romance comics Marvel was publishing at the time. So emphasizing this, emphasizing this connection, reactivating this cultural memory, but not exactly turning Hawkeye into romance comics. Right, and then even with this kind of 15 panel page, clearly there's some, uh, you know, dramatic reworking, uh, even at the level of kind of panel layout convention, right? Certainly, and the and also I'm in mean, panel. Uh, is both its own thing, uh, both a very noirish image, and also perhaps a reworking of the, the, the teary face that is so iconic of romance comics. So that is all of this working at the same time. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, I love this. Um, so, of course, you're, you know, you mentioned magazines and Metal Hurlant and Heavy Metal, this fascinating connection that you sort of you know, excavate in your heavy metal book. Um, talk about, can you talk about these transatlantic cross-pollinations? Yeah, um, so this is something that, again, I mean, I feel that my, my whole, everything I've written so far uh, has been driven by chance encounters. But the, um, the, the book on uh, heavy metal already started with the idea um, that um, Jean-Pierre Dionnet, who was the founder of Metal Hurlant, um, was interviewed for a book in the early 21st century and had the most disparaging comments about heavy, uh, heavy metal, saying we, we gave them everything we had, we gave them great artists, but they were only interested in having naked girls and horses. And the, um, so th the, the quote was so striking that I sought out some copies from, of heavy metal to, to, to see for myself whether that was true, whether they, that was, um, and, and that it made me realize um, that uh, the, I knew nothing about heavy metal, that no one in France has, had ever read heavy metal magazine because to a large extent, it simply translated uh, French, com French comics. But also I realized that in heavy metal, some of, the, some of the, the stories that were published only in heavy metal had been imported and translated back in France, but in other magazines. So Metal Hurlant sent, sent stories to heavy metal. Heavy metal published its own stories, but they were not translated back into Metal Hurlant. They were translated in other magazines. And I also realized I had read many of these, that stories, these stories, sorry, because my parents had these magazines. So, the whole idea that there was this weird cycle, these weird, these weird circulations, uh, was the starting point for 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 the the inquiry. For it get, get, got me to think about the conditions in which su such circulations could arise, and the um, so I started. Uh, getting in touch with people and I was again encouraged to turn what started as an article into a book and um, so talking to people uh, made me realize that 
some of the publishers of the, uh, in France of these stories were still alive and they had archives and that even though most of the contracts m were lost, uh, it was still possible to excavate that story and that the people were, some of the people were still alive. It was still possible to get testimonies. And then you ask to, uh, I got in touch with um, Howard, Ch Howard Chaikin and Howard Chaikin told me that he uh, had been, um, he had been reading, he was actually reading French magazines in the late 1960s, and I wasn't aware of that. And there is talking to people, uh, there, were, there was a, a galaxy of recollection and memories, but people had not connected these me memories. So they had been writing that uh, specific aspects, but the whole story had not been told. And then you realize that this um, heavy metal, metal connection has to be understood in a broader context of, say, increased mobility between Europe and the United States, which meant that people could visit and they could uh, import underground comics from the, the West Coast to Paris. And that at the same time, uh, American writers were, sorry, American uh, comics creators were fascinated with the French, uh, with the French graphic novel novels and with the status of comics in France and that this cross-pollination appeared um, over a rather short period of time. Um, in the 1960s you have personal connections. By the middle of the 1970s everyone's talking to everyone. So there's a very narrow time frame um, in which you see this internationalization, which also results in, in manga being imported in the United States. Some of the early articles in manga are published in heavy metal or Epic Illustrated, and they are understood as part of that interest in foreign comics in general. So this interconnectedness and also the fact that uh, people like Otomo uh, in Japan see work, French work through the American edition, uh, that also can be reconstructed. I mean, that's not what I reworked on, but again, the, the connections start happening in the early 1970s, and then they spread everywhere. And you see a sort of unified comics world by the end of the, that decade. Is there a particular, I, I mean, I'm thinking about, I mean, Mobius um, has had a huge influence on uh, Latin American comics creators. Is there anybody in, in within the Americas, North or South, um, that you particularly saw kind of uh, a direct influence from someone like Mobius, who is obviously such a huge creative force in uh, Metal Urholan and, you know, folks here. I would say the um, Kurtzman stuff, um, that's definitely, that's a major influence in France. Um, so Kurtzman and Elder in particular, but I would say everything that, that Kurtzman did in the, um, in the 1950s and early 1960s, so that would be Mad uh, Help, sorry, Mad Trump, Humbug and Help, all that was a major influence. And early Mebius actually draws like Bill Elder, Will Elder, uh, there's a, um, that influence is clearly felt in his early 1960s work and people at Pilot are the, so René Goscinny, who was the editor in chief at Pilot had worked with Kurtzman in the 1950s. They were personal friends. Um, and when he, the way he ran his magazine, you can clearly see the influence again of Mad, but of Kurtzman more generally. And you, the, the stories that are remembered from that time, the things that were the serialized narratives, they don't look like, like mad at all. But if you take the magazines themselves, if you go back to the 1960s, that influence is everywhere. Uh, you have small pocket books, pilot pocket books, which, are f which could be um, pocket mag magazines. Everything is um, what, would happen here, what would happen if, would it, would it be funny if you replace this by that? Uh, plus all the chickens, the chicken fat, all this, um, the, the concept that Elder invented this idea of filling the background with tiny details that you need to decipher. Uh, again, many artists at Pilot did that. So that influence was filtered through uh, René Goscinny, through other authors, but mm -hmm. it's really everywhere in the late 1960s French comics. Wow, including Mebius. So adaptation, of course, all of this is in a way talking about kind of 
adaptation, right? I mean, so we have Metal Roland, heavy metal, and then heavy metal kind of stories coming back into different spaces. But you also work very specifically within the space of adaptation. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that's different from your work in genre or the same? I don't I think it's deeply connected. Um, it's deeply connected because genres function as, um, they function within comics. You have a, a, a generic system, but that generic system is connected to a broader generic system which exists across media. And it would be absurd to tackle um, alien in comic books without um, trying to understand f first how alien of the 1979 movie fitted within the Hollywood genres. Uh, and because um, comics have been a, such a, I was going to say margin, marginal form, but at least they have had less visibility than cinema, uh, they tend to reincorporate the generic system that you find in other more potent media. So, I mean, Understanding adaptation can only be, sorry, genres can only be done in the context of um, understanding transmedia, intermedia circulations. But adaptation is especially interesting, interesting to me because um, that's a narrow space. Um, Thomas Leitch, who, who's written a great book about adaptation, uh, film adaptation and its discontent, described adaptation as one end of the slippery slope of intertextuality. And I like this idea that, of course, adaptation is basically a specific form of intertextuality, but that because it's such a specific case, you can construct a corpus in which you can really understand media specificity. And when I say media specificity, I mean not simply the affordances of the media, but also the economic system and the, um, the um, cultural role of the media, the practice, the cultural practices associated with each medium. So adaptation is, far, is nice because it makes it possible to create thorough studies of objects which are twinned, which work uh, in conjunction with each other. So you clearly see the, the, the gaps, the differences um, between media. Also something which I find fascinating about adaptation is when you, st when you study series of adaptation, the same object being adapted several times. Um, there, some stories by Poe, for instance, tend to be adapted uh, every five years. So you see the successive adaptations and they tell you not about the adaptation process itself, but about the history of comics, because that's the changing factor. The story remains the same. The cultural status of Poe remains more or less the same between the 1950s and now. But what changes is the way comics position themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these uh, literary, uh, literary writers. So for all of these reasons, um, adaptation is, I think, makes for very satisfying uh, studies and very precise stories, this is a study story, uh, in which you do not have to question your corpus. You don't have to invent a corpus. You don't have to check for the unexpected or the marginal. You can really focus on these twin objects and try to unpack them and go to, and be very specific about what's happening in, in, the, in the specific story. Wow, fa fascinating. Um, tell me, um, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of your other work on genre and, well, things, apparatus, gatekeepers. Um, I know you're very, very interested, not just in the kind of semiotics, but also the cultural space that these um, narratives exist within. Um, yeah, genre, comics gate, the interpretive power. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. Um, so this was a, a chapter which I was a bit uncertain about. Um, I was afraid of making a fool of myself, basically, because um, this is really about the use of genre. So my starting point in the book is that um, genres only exist in as much as they are in use. Genres do not exist in comics. Genres are discourses, are ways to approach and, and organize comics, and also ways to, to create new comics, of course, but within this shared understanding. And the Comics Brigade, I think, is a, um, an interesting example of the fact that um, 
we tend to assume that there's a consensus about JOR. Yes, we may disagree on borderline cases. Uh, we, may disagree, we may discuss, I don't know, this one thing, and maybe disagree about whether this is superhero work or not. But that's fine. I mean, marginal, we understand this to be a marginal work, and we acknowledge that we may disagree, um, that we may disagree about that specific work. But Comics Gate is really about, I mean, Comics Gate is a lot of things. Um, it's everything that you, everything that has been said about the movement is true. It is um, conservative. Uh, it is often shockingly misogynistic. It's all of that. I mean, that's my starting ass assumption. But I also saw it as an example of contentious discussion about jaws themselves. It seems to me that part of the things that comic skaters were trying to accomplish and taking inspiration from what had happened in other media, in particular video games and uh, literary science fiction. Part of the things that they were trying to trying to accomplish was to offer uh, an alternative definition of the superhero genre saying no your system of value your um your core elements the core elements of superheroes that's not what we're interested in we're interested in a narrower definition Re actual superhero work should follow not should not only have superpowered beings but also have uh white males being superpowered beings and if, if it's not uh we are not ready to accept that works which fall outside of this perimeter are valuable actual superhero work and the idea of using kickstarter of producing their own comics again we may argue about the quality of this production uh i'm not elevating that production but it suggests that it it was an um an attempt to not only create discourses but also objects to validate these discourses so there, there was a, an attempt to rebuild an alternative universe uh, in which the whole generic system was different and that um, there was there was an assertion of interpretive power that was enabled by social media enabled by the leveling power of social media in which one twitter account is another twitter account there's no privileged space for creators on twitter or if there is it's very narrow and it works within a very specific community but apart from that i mean if you have more follower, followers than alan moore then you are more important than alan moore on twitter uh that's a, a different um that's a different um system of value so they use social media, they use that leveling power uh, of the social media to try and offer a um, contentious interpretation of JAWS. And although they failed, I thought it was important to realize that this could not simply be brushed away, uh, that the method that was, that was used was actually um, a more, um, a hyperbolic version of the disagreements that we always have about yours. That what was happening there was really what happens when you have, I don't know, any prominent critic saying, well, we should consider this work to be horror or science fiction or superhero. Using your symbolic capital, using your prestige within a specific community to make genre assertions which try to bend or reshape the whole generic system. Wow, yeah, that's a really fascinating work to me. Um, and especially this idea that we're not just passive sponges and that kind of these new communities and these m massive sort of Twitter, right, social media spaces can and do have a power to push back and to carve out new spaces. You mentioned um, Metal Hurlan and uh, Manga. Um, so, yeah, I do know that you're very interested in global manga and manga. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more? So I'm really indebted to Casey Brianta for, for this part of the, of the book. So that's not exactly my area of specialty, but I'm interested in the idea that global manga um, makes us reconsider, rec reconsider the value of the manga label. Uh, we tend to I tend to assume that manga is a neutral, objective descriptor. Manga is what comes from Japan. Manga means comics in Japan. So uh, manga is what we use to 
uh, just describe in France and the, in the US we do, that we use to describe um, anything that comes from any comics that come from Japan. The same way bon dessiné used in American context would mean European comics. So that's the base value. But then you realize that manga um, isn't used that way. That manga comes to has come to signify to signify things that look like manga things that borrow um, recognizable traits from manga and that uh, in particular everything that comes from Asia even though that should probably be that should be manhua or um, can't remember what, how, how they're called in China but the um, there are these specific terms but that's all these comics tend to be lumped and then under the same umbrella um, that would be manga and then uh, the moment European or American creators embrace the, um, the visual logic of manga or the economic practices producing these small, um, these small but very long uh, black and white vo volumes, then these tend to be discussed and received as manga as well. And you realize that manga has shifted from being an objective term uh, neutral descriptor to being again something that is flexible, something that is an element of discourse, something that can be negotiated between various users, uh, between various communities, and for some specific communities uh, to describe European or American manga as manga is obviously wrong, but for um, general uh, for for general entertainment website, it will probably be fine because they are not talking to the same community. They don't have the same expertise, and then manga becomes something that is traded, that is uh, discussed, that can be refined. And of course, these um, these um, large entertainment websites can you use their own prestige to push that exception. And you see that things that are really not manga in any way, uh, tend to be described using that, uh, the term. So um, that was a bit confusing, but the, um, to try to, to, to sum it up, uh, the global manga uh, is really a way to acknowledge the fact that manga is not a factual descriptor, that it can be used that way, that it doesn't, uh, the, um, that that usage hasn't been invalidated, but that really when we say manga, we are discussing a loose collection of objects which may or may not have a direct connection with Japan. Yeah, that's really um, liberating, I think, and important, um, and also making those sort of nuanced distinctions that we need to make. Um, I'm, I pulled this Matt Madden's history of the U, of U.S. comics in eight panels. Um, I know that this is something that you've used before, but can you walk us through how you might uh, use this in a classroom setting? All right. So the original com Matt Madden's comic is only six panels. So that's panels two to seven. Um, and in this, um, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant work in which Madden use one character and, tr and uh, puts that character into typical recognizable situations from the history of American comic books. So starting with Superman or Superman-like character, moving on to Mad, moving on to Robert Crumb and Underground Comics, and then we have Watchmen, Mouse, and a, so, uh, a hybrid between Chris Ware and Dan Klaus. So I use that as a, um, in the past, I used that at the beginning of a class on American comics, uh, asking students, what do you think is missing? Now I tend to use it at the end of my class, asking, so now that we've worked together, that now that we've tried to establish a broader history of American comics, what do you see as missing from this? And the first time I did this, I thought it would be funny to produce the extra panels to integrate some of the answers given by students, but also some of my own reflections. So I redrew, I went and drew panel one and eight to create this expanded version of Madden's original, uh, original uh, comics, with his permission, by the way. And so I use 
that expanded version after asking quite the asking my students what they think, and they will often point to the fact that um, to the gaps to the fact that well, first of all, uh, there's one male character which tends to invisibilize all the female characters and also the female readers uh, that are the, in those years. Um, the, to encapsulate the 1950s only through MAD is to ignore everything else that was going on at the time. Uh, horror comics, romance comics, crime comics, all of, I mean, this flowering of jaws in the late 1940s. Also, the, the, uh, the complete absence of 1960s Marvel is striking to them. Uh, is, and the arguable over-representation of 1986-1987, since we have met both Watchmen and Mouse, uh, standing for that uh, these two years, actually in reverse order, because Mouse should be before Watchmen, if we want to re-quibble with a... So I, I love this page because um, whether you use it at the, as a conversation starter, what do you recognize? Um, do you see anything missing? Or at the end of class, to, as a summary of everything that's been discussed, it works brilliantly. And to be clear, I'm not criticizing Madden. Uh, it was not doing the work of a comics historian. It was offering a personal and, again, very effective history of the medium in just six panels, which is, a, uh, which is amazing in itself. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And I love the additions. Um, that last panel as one of the additions, what, tell, tell me where you want us to go with that one. Oh, oh, I, I was really struck by the fact that, so um, this is Raina Telgemeier uh, and Scott Pilgrim in the back. Um, so that trying to call attention to the, that massive shift in comics readership in the early two thousand since the early two thousands with the shift to young adult comics um, and to female readers, female creators. So trying to call attention to that um, with using the most successful would be Rain Talgemeyer, probably the central comics creator, and also really trying to call attention to the fact that so much of the history of comics had been, um, has been um, moved out of you, has been invisibilized, and that um, even the, the growth of young adult comics has been ignored for a while. Strikingly so. I mean, there's a, this, there was this at least 10 year gap in the academia uh, between the moment these comics started I mean, between the moment Scholastic created their graphics line, 2005, and it's only in the past few years that you see articles and uh, scholars trying to recomprehend what's going on in these young adult comics. So Bart Beatty has obviously done amazing work on that and has the uh, greatest comic books of all time with Benjamin Wu, but uh, calling attention to the system of values which made it possible not to take into consideration these comics. But of course, I mean, many scholars are doing excellent work at the moment. But again, I'm struck by the, the fact that it took 10 to 15 years. And I'm including myself, of course, in this um, blindness. I wasn't aware of this until quite recently. Yeah, no, so, um, so extraordinary. And this leads us, of course, to our next kind of um, conversation point, which is that you started, we started and you mentioned how you had written a script for your sister um, and now we're just talking about, you know, the addition of some extraordinarily important panels to Matt's um, comics, U.S. history. And, but you also do your own comic notes and comic essays. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty fond of this, especially since um, I used to think, and to a large extent, I still think that I cannot draw. But um, I was, um, so... 15 years ago, um, I started doing some short autobiographical comics. Um, just, um, I was toying with the idea of drawing comics because again, my sister is so talented as an illustrator that that, that was, a, I was intimidated and there was simply no way for me to compete. So I did all the, these sketches and doodles, but I was really, 
wary of doing something seriously. And I was given uh, great supplies. I mean, an actual excellent notebook and pens. So I was encouraged to, to take the, that leap. Uh, and uh, so I started doing these autobiographical comics. And then I realized that I really wanted to use these comics to also address things that interested me as a scholar and researcher. And what you have on the left here is the, the first thing I did in that vein, which was trying to reflect on a horror movie called 2000 Maniacs. And the fact that even though it's a terrible movie, um, it gripped me when I watched it unexpectedly. I wasn't expected to, expecting to be, um, to have more than a, I don't know, curiosity for the movie. But there was a, an especially gory moment, which really, captured my attention even though I was on uh, in my living room and not under any stressful condition. So I was trying to come to terms with, with that and it was published in the, on the website the Hooded Utilitarian where it received encouraging comments and these comments um, let me got me thinking about the idea of using comics to do research. So not simply doing comics for to chronicle my family life, but to go slightly beyond that and try to think about the formal, the, the benefits of using comics for research. So I produced a few example of, examples of this, and then I uh, coordinated a, a workshop at my university to try and encourage students to produce their own, their own research comics. I also produced a few and continued to sketch notes during, uh, during conferences. So something that was really a marginal hobby has turned into um, actually a, a research focus of mine. I've uh, coordinated a, a journal issue on the the idea of the the idea of um, comics as research, and, and I should say that that this happened shortly before um, Nick Susanis published and flattening and demonstrated that there was, it was indeed possible to publish, not only to conduct, but also to publish at a legitimate publisher, uh, comics as research. So that was very encouraging. And again, I wish I had time to do more, but this is so time consuming that um, it's tantalizingly, it's tantalizing, it's there. I wish I could do more, but it takes, it would require not doing books on Jaws, for instance. Absolutely. Yes, I know. Um, it's one thing already to kind of labor and craft a script, but then to do the drawings. Oh my goodness, right? The visuals. Um, so gosh, we have, you've been taking us on this sort of wonderful journey with uh, your work, your insights. Where are you seeing the heartbeat of comics, comic studies today? Well, you know, I've been thinking about that. Um, and I'm not sure I know. I'm not sure there's one heartbeat. Um, I know, I mean, you, you have a, an image from uh, Charles Burns here. I will read anything by Charles Burns. Um, I tend to look to manga, uh, but I don't think this is because the heartbeat is there. It's because I know so little about manga that there is so much for me to discover, at least. Um, so I'm not sure. It seems to me that we have so much um, areas of vitality and creation and things that are exhilarating to look at. And I, mean, I cannot read. Um, there are several thousands albums published in France every year. So I tend to discover them five years later and discover that this and that other is amazing. And that's something to, there's, that there's a whole, uh, a whole work for me to discover. So I think it would be presumptuous uh, for me because to, to try to locate uh, vital in comics, I can only describe what I'm attracted to. Um, gosh, this has been um, w absolutely wonderful, Nicolas. Merci beaucoup pour parler avec nous. Uh, and thank you for joining us and sharing your journey and your story, Nicolas. Well, thanks for having me. That was a pleasure. I hope that made sense. Oh, yes.